So tonight I wanted to share a reading which has particularly touched me. It's from a um, classic book of Zen called Swampland Flowers, uh, the letters and lectures of Zen master Da Wei. This is a classic. Uh, this Da Wei is a Chinese master who lived um, from 1089 to 1163. And he was a big figure in Rinzai Zen, our tradition, our lineage of Zen practice. By his Chinese, pronounced in Korean, the name is Dei He, Great Wisdom, Zen Master Great Wisdom. And he wrote these, um, he was a very, um, for his day, uh, an accessible Zen Master uh, who would answer letters um, not just from monks and nuns, or dialogues with monks and nuns, but also would receive letters from his lay followers and would answer them about how to practice, uh, how to keep this practice in everyday life. So he always has very appropriate topics. Some of it, a lot of it has um, kind of old style language, but if you, if you bear with it and listen closely to it, it, it speaks to our practice today. One of the sections, I haven't read the whole book because I don't read Buddhist books. Uh, I'm very unlettered in Buddhist texts, to be honest, but just a few have crossed the radar over the years. This one has been since the beginning, since before I became a monk, something I've just kind of pop around and look at from time to time. And this is a response to a general, a Chinese general, to Commander Chang Yi Chi. He's answering. It's a really beautiful statement, very beautiful teaching. Dao Yi says, And this speaks to us. This is really beautiful business, what he's talking about. He says, In the conduct of their daily activities, sentient beings have no illumination. If you go along with their ignorance, they're happy. If you oppose their ignorance, they become vexed. They become angry. They become confused is actually a better word, but angry. Buddhas and bodhisattvas are not this way. They make use of ignorance, considering this the business of Buddhas. Since sentient beings make ignorance their home, to go against it amounts to breaking up their home. Going with their ignorance is adapting to where they're at to influence and guide them. In the conduct of their daily activities, sentient beings have no illumination. You know, the way people live their lives, most people have no guidance mechanism, no light, no true sense of what they're doing and why they do things. Sentient beings have no illumination. If you go along with their ignorance, they're really happy. If you oppose their ignorance, they become vexed. That's the whole nut of the teaching here. So with sentient beings, which means deluded beings, most people we meet, certainly ones not practicing doing some form of self-examination, frankly self-examination, 
If you go along with their bullshit, they're happy. And to put it into a little New Jersey. If you go along with their bullshit, they're really happy. If you oppose their bullshit, they don't like you so much. It's really how much we see this in our relations, particularly with really, really ignorant kinds of mentalities that we can meet. If you go along with their stupid stuff, they're really happy. They like you. You're popular. But if you go against it, if you have some insight, if you have some view, if you oppose their ignorance, doesn't just mean if you have a different opinion, but if you have some insight and you oppose their ignorance, they become vexed. How many people in marriages, especially uh, those who practice and are in a partnership with someone who doesn't practice, how many times over the uh, some three decades I've been practicing to meet couples or, or friends or family members where there's um, one of the members starts practicing and really seeing into their life. Or it could be in the case of someone who makes a step to maybe be sober. Or, or do some intensive therapy, you could say. There are levels of this. Of course, doing intensive meditation is one that's going to really open up a lot, but in terms of other aspects with therapy, your own world, your own code, getting hacked successfully, holistically with a trained professional, you'll grow. You'll, you might end up growing past what you were in that couple, in that partnership. And then, if you no longer go along with the ignorant way that your partner has been with you, the irritation level on their side gets higher and probably on yours as well. So if you go along with their ignorance, they're happy. If you just go along with it, they're happy. If you oppose it, they become vexed. This is really key. Buddhas and bodhisattvas are not this way. Buddhas and bodhisattvas make use of ignorance. Flexibly, making use of ignorance. Considering this the business of Buddhas. You don't avoid ignorance or have trouble with it. If you practice and develop some wisdom and some insight and a strong center, then you can use ignorance, the ignorance of this world, the ignorance of others, and consider that the business of Buddhas. In Sino-Korean it's called Dong Sasop. Dong Sasop. My teacher used to call it together action. But that's a really, yeah, it's a kind of literal translation of Dong Sasop. But it's a wise form of it. Wise together action. Going along with someone's ignorance, skillfully leading them to a better place. A very interesting story that arises in the history of De Sansanim's teaching in the West was. Um, uh, a letter I read once of his that um, a student in the West, an American who, this letter was written probably in the 70s, it was after the 60s, and the young generation of that time had felt it had become free of the materialism and the, the empty life of their parents' generation, which looked for just material things and status and high-quality experiences that the younger generation, which liked nature and harmony and peace and all of that, started to oppose as, as empty and, and wasteful. So the student wrote to De Sansanim how he and his father constantly had conflict, constantly had conflict, constantly had conflict. And this student who was practicing Zen with De Sansanim 
He said, my father really likes expensive cognac. I think that that's so horrible. There's so many suffering people in the world. So he wants to talk to me all the time, but I think, how can I talk to a man who would spend money on expensive cognacs when there's so many suffering people in the world we could give that money to? And so, but we have this conflict, and I'm living at home with him, and I'm having this really hard time, and we're constantly in this conflict, this conflict, and it's embodied by my father's typical bourgeois habits. <laughs> we'll never get along. No. How can I get along with I want my father. I'm getting liberated by meditation. This Zen is really helping my life. I want him to learn about this because it'll fix his life and fix his foolish bourgeois life. But he won't listen to me when I talk about Buddhism. How can I help him learn? He wrote this letter to Desansanim. And Desansanim's answer is amazing. He said, you go out and bottle, buy a bottle of expensive cognac. You go home and you give this bottle of expensive cognac to your father and sit down and drink together with him. Have a drink. And do this again and again. When your father has something that he likes, don't immediately criticize him for it the way you tell me you do. Listen to him. Understand why he likes these things. Then slowly, slowly, over time, your father will trust you and maybe he will open his mind and listen to you. I should try to find this letter someday. The way it's expressed, as always, the way Desansim did, it was pure it was acupuncture. Mind acupuncture, perfect mind acupuncture. So he writes back, and a couple of months later, the guy writes back again. This is from the 1970s. You have the letter, he writes back saying, they ask him, how can I thank you enough? My relationship with my father is completely different. I did as you suggested, although it was really hard at first. I went into the store and I bought, I wanted to make sure when I bought it, I went to a store on the other side of town so that none of my friends would see me doing such a foolish thing. I went, I brought it, I gave it up. My father was so shocked to receive this from me. And he was, imagine how much more shocked he was when I sat down and enjoyed it with him. And then when my father enjoyed, he told me stories that he had never told me before. He told me experiences that he had never shared with me before. And he said, I did this one or two or three times, sitting down with him and drinking from this. And then our conversations opened up into other areas. And then one day, my father, after having a drink, said, Son, you are very different these days. What is it that has made you so changed and so pleasant to be around? And I answered my father, Well, nowadays, Dad, I practice meditation. And this meditation makes me feel very happy. And his father said, Yes, you seem settled and happy in a way I never saw you. And the man wrote, from this point, my father asked if I would introduce him to a book of Buddhism, or I don't know how far it went. But there was a harmony that appeared. So that's this line, beautiful. In the conduct of their daily activities, sentient beings have no illumination. If you go along with their ignorance, they're happy. If you oppose their ignorance, they become vexed. Buddhas and bodhisattvas are not this way. They make use of ignorance. They know how to use ignorance, considering this the business of Buddhas. Since sentient beings make ignorance their home, to go against it amounts to breaking up their home. Going along with it is adapting to where they're at 
to influence and guide them. Beautiful. It's extraordinary. So this practice of Zen, the practice of meditation, and certainly the teachings of Buddhism, it's not about becoming some holier person who's above and better than and more clarified and more perfect than others. That leads to a kind of an arrogance, a spiritual arrogance. We know often the people in our circle of friends and relatives, the ones who are really strict about their religion, especially ones on the extreme side of it, going extreme enough even to fundamentalist, develop an arrogance about other people who don't believe or practice like that. And that arrogance causes them to have even less ability to influence other people with their beautiful teachings. So it's really powerful about this. That's not what this practice is about. The business of Buddhism bodhisattvas is to use the ignorance of sentient beings to shape and guide them towards finding themselves. And we see that in the actions of Jesus. You know, you had John the Baptist and Jesus, the two big figures of the spiritual movement of the day. John the Baptist remained in the desert, away from the noisy, dirty cities filled with stupid people, indulging themselves on good food and good drink. And he stayed in the wastelands, often by the Jordan River, eating locusts fasting, wearing a hair shirt, a hair shirt. If you've ever touched one of these hair shirts, it's stiff, it's not fur, hair. It's this stiff little spiky thing. It hurts when you're constantly scratching. There's nothing comfortable about it. And they live in that to deny themselves pleasure. So John the Baptist represented this extreme of staying away from ignorance, the ignorance of the cities and the hypocritical priestly class. And he was a good man. He was a true spiritual practitioner. And his speech was, repent, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, repent. He was a, a fundamentalist. A fundamentalist. And then you had Jesus, who was a co, a, a sort of a colleague in the tradition, who was in the city, who was hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors, common workers, eating and drinking together with him. In fact, his lifestyle was so deeply involved with the ignorance of the people in the cities, that it's in the Bible, he says to the, the priests come by, they're constantly, the other rabbis are checking him out and saying, oh, what a bad rabbi this Jesus guy is, how bad he is. Look at him, look at who he hangs out with, these drug addicts. It would be like a bishop of our day or a priest hanging out with drug addicts. If you're Greek, what would it be if one of the priests with a beard was hanging out in a t-shirt with the punks and junkies in Echarchia or Kukaki, you know, just hanging out in the street, in the bars, the burger joints, you know, what would they think of such a priest? So Jesus was hanging out with these people, and the, one day the, there must have been some of them talking about him, or they were arguing with him. And Jesus says to them, it's in the gospel, he said, You say that I am a drunkard and a glutton. You say that about me. I hear that. You criticize me 
being a drunkard and a glutton. When John the Baptist refuses food and refuses drink, you say he's possessed by a demon. He's crazy. That's another word in those days of being. He's crazy. And yet, when the Son of Man comes and eats and drinks, blah, 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 you say he's a drunkard and a glutton. So Jesus operated in the field of being with people's ignorance. And of John the Baptist and Jesus, which one was more influential to today? Who is the one whose words and actions and life had more of an impact? That's not really a fair thing to say, actually. But it's a simplistic way of looking at this. Jesus was in there with people. He was in the mix. And how many of the Pharisees and Sadducees are educated in the texts properly and what to do on this day and what you can eat and what you can and what you should touch and what you shouldn't touch and who you should be with and who you shouldn't. The ones who knew all of the textual rights and wrongs. Jesus knew that stuff, hardcore, but he was in there flowing with people, being with them, being with them. But then when he spoke with them about things, they would listen. So beautiful, this line. Buddhas and bodhisattvas are not like that. They don't oppose it. They use people's ignorance. They use people's ignorance to guide them. It's a really great thought. Since sentient beings make ignorance their home, to go against it amounts to breaking up their home. Going with it is adapting to where they're at. To influence and guide them. So that's a, such a powerful, I think in all of Dawi's teachings, it's really one nut that has stood out. In fact, much else of what he's done, I haven't really been so affected by there's other things here that are, when there's a whole record of really powerful stuff. So that's our practice. We're not here trying to become some holy higher thing. We're trying to be true people who wake up and use good things to help people, use bad things to help people. Use purity to save all sentient beings, use not pure to save all sentient beings. Not being controlled by pure or impure, good or bad. But you have to have, as De Sansim said, you have to have a strong center. You can't just hear that, go out and say, okay, I'm just going to hang out in the bars and do this and people will follow me. You have to practice. The key is practice. Practicing and letting that illumination in a clear place help people and in a dirty and noisy place also help people. So that's what we do with this practice. Everyday practicing is very important. Keeps our GPS very clear. Then any stormy situation, in good weather or bad weather, we can find our direction, not just for ourselves, but take many of our fellow sentient beings to a good place.